Okay, folks, so before we move on to um, looking at how we can deal with a large data set using OpenRefine, um, I just want to highlight here uh, right away um, one of the features that I think is so great about this program. So the fact that it can parse JSON in the first place is a huge deal. Um, secondly, however, I want to highlight that it gives us a piece of very valuable information right away up front um, that uh, we, don't, we don't get with Excel. Um, and actually, because Excel can be quite slow with large data sets or can just kind of be slow in general, um, is somehow much more complicated to get than we would like, which is this number, right? So right off the top, when I have copied that JSON file in here and opened it, what I know is that I have 664 rows of data, which to me says that I probably have 664 active city bike stations in the city of New York. That's a handy number to have, right? Um, if you were writing a story about city bike, this would be a super quick way to get that data point um, and without having to worry about, I mean, A, without having to deal with downloading and parsing the data, as we know the historical data um, has every single ride, not just every individual station. Um, so this is just a really handy thing. Now, you'll notice also that this is showing me a limited number of rows. I can increase this to 50. Um, but what this does is demonstrate, while I can scroll down here, that OpenRefine is not a browsing tool, okay? So again, if we need to just kind of check out our data set, we're going to want to do that with something like text edit, just to take a peek at it, um, and then uh, and maybe open it in OpenRefine if it's a really large file, and then kind of see like what the column headers are and things like that. Um, but it's we're not going to browse, we're not going to browse in the same way it might in Excel, right? We're not going to go scrolling through the this data set. Um, we are, however, able to browse in a way that I think is much more efficient um, and insightful, um, uh, which is using something called facets. So to illustrate this, I'm going to come back to OpenRefine. You'll see that actually in my open project, I now have this available. I can just delete it by Xing it, but there it is. So in this case, I'm going to use, um, whoops, um, I'm going to say choose file, and I'm going to go back to, I'm going to go back to this big 324 megabyte file, uh, which is all of our September data. Um, so if you remember, we actually didn't end up doing with this file, dealing with this file in its entirety originally because it was just too big. Now I'm going to hit next here and let's see what happens. So first of all, it's this uploading thing, but we see that it's pitching, it's suggesting that it's going to take less than 20 seconds to actually upload this data. Now the caveat here is that uploading this data isn't the same thing as opening the file. What it's doing is kind of scanning the file for us, which is great because even with a very large file, we can successfully use OpenRefine to kind of get a view on it, get a handle on it. Um, and you see here that what it's done is it's given me a preview of, whoops, oh, that's weird. Oh, it's, you know what it is? It's interpreting my, um, I'm using a multi-touch thing and it keeps interpreting that as a back. So we're just gonna try this again. Um, but again, it takes so little time um, that it's really not a problem here in the same way that it would be with something like Excel. Um, so what it does is it lets us preview the data. It gives us, you know, the first couple dozen rows. Um, it has automatically intuited that uh, this is a CSV file. Um, so we can kind of get a, a sense of what we're looking at, right? We get all of our columns here and we get the beginnings of the data set. Um, this is probably going to go to, okay, so it gives, it does the first hundred rows for us. Now, another important part of this, and again, this is sort of supported in Excel, but not in a very elegant way. Um, I have actually tried opening this entire file. Um, and at the moment, I don't have um, enough RAM associated with this program on my computer to do it. So um, I could show you that, but we're not going to, because that's not always going to be an option, we're going to talk about how to work around those kinds of constraints. Um, instead, what I'm going to do is point out that in a much nicer way than Excel, I have this option down here to say load at most some number of rows of data. So right off the bat, before I get into a problem of trying to automatically open a file and then not being able to open the whole file and then having to figure out how to parse off pieces of the file, I can just say, look, you know, let's go ahead and just start with um, 50,000 rows of data, right? So I can even do 100,000, let's do 100,000. So one, two, one, two, three, okay? Um, and uh, interesting, oh, it has a store file source in here, which is interesting. Um, but now I can just go ahead and create, so I'm gonna say September city bike 
first hundred. Okay, so that's just how I decided to name it. It's a little bit descriptive, and I'm going to say create project. And now this is going to take a minute. Okay, so it's saying this is going to take about two minutes to do. I'm using about half of my data, so I could probably open a couple hundred thousand rows of data in this without too much trouble. Um, uh, you know, if I get up to a few million, it's it's probably gonna it's probably gonna crash out. Um, but I could solve that by allocating more memory. I just don't want to deal with that at the moment. So um, some of the things again. So in this case, the number of rows is not super informative because I specified that when opening the file. However, there are lots of other things that I can do that are super interesting right away. So the first thing is this question of how many different start station IDs are there, right? We didn't actually even try to answer this question uh, last week. And the reason why is that it's really tedious to do in Microsoft Excel. Basically, the only option that I have in Excel is to sort and then try to count the specific ones. Now, for those of you who have more experience in Microsoft Excel, you might say, oh, I could create a filter. Well, you're absolutely right. You can create a filter in Microsoft Excel. But the nice thing is that in OpenRefine, you don't need to know how to do anything special. Um, my, the way that I interact with columns is always going to be through this down arrow, and I just have this nice feature called Facet. Okay, this is where the sort of diamond analogy comes in, and I'm going to say I want a text facet. And what that's going to do is it's going to show me every unique instance of, uh, of start station ID. So let's give it a second here. And there we go. So right away, what do we know? We know that we have in this first 100,000 rows, there's only 573 out of, we know a total probably of 664 stations that appear as the start station for trips in these first 100,000 rows. Again, the 100,000 rows here is an arbitrary amount. Um, we would want to, you know, work with a whole month or a whole week, for example, we might choose to do that. Um, and it's, so it's showing me how many choices I have. And now the really neat thing is I can sort by count here and it's telling me how many times each one of them appears, right? So again, right off the bat, I know that in this data set, station ID 519, which I can now select, is the most, is the most commonly, is the most common starting point um, for trips, right? And just by clicking on it, I'm going to just end up with only those ones. And I can see there are 1135, right? Which matches this count. Um, matching rows. 1135 trips out of the 100,000 that I have began at Pershing Square North. For those of you not familiar, that's right near Grand Central Station. Maybe not so surprising. The really cool thing now here is, and I could go down the line here, right? I could say, okay, what's the next one? Uh, West Street and Chamber Street. That's actually really interesting to me as well. That's down, that's Lower Manhattan, top of Battery Park. Um, actually, let's look at this one because I think that's more intriguing to me anyway. I'm also more, I'm also very familiar with that area of town. So one thing I might want to ask is, okay, so we know that there are 794 trips that started there. The question is, where do they end? So this is where faceting can come in again and kind of giving us some insight. So I can then, I've selected one uh, set of data on the left, right? So all of the, all of the start station IDs are 426. But now I can facet on the end station ID. And what it's going to show me is within my selection, what are what was the most common or least common or whatever we want end station ID. So again, I'm going to choose sort by count. And I'll see that of those 700, of those 794, 35 ended them, ended at station 3256. And if I click on this. Again, what I'm doing is it's narrowing down and narrowing down. And now I see that it is Pier 40 at Hudson River Park. Um, so I'm gonna have to remind myself where that is, what Pier 40 is. I think that this may well be, let's see, Pier 40. Now it's not that many trips, right? I mean, it's only 35 or so. Okay, so we have this going up to the community boathouse. I wonder if there's any patterns about, say, when this is done. Let's see what we can get on uh, start sign. Let's do a timeline facet. So you notice there are different types of facets here. Okay. Nope, oh, that doesn't seem to. Okay, so unfortunately, the format of our start and end times here is not such that it's going to let us do a timeline facet easily. But I could start to then parse down into the start time and stop time 
to understand, uh, you know, what the what the organization is. Just by looking at these, eh, let's see, if I show 50, then I should see them all. There doesn't seem to be a huge pattern um, in this, but obviously that's a popular destination. So it would be, you know, you could potentially see, you know, what are what are people doing in that? If I were to say, take this back up to, um, now if I want to get rid of a facet, right, I want to expand my, my set out again, um, then I can just close this, right? So again, I'm going to see here that I have the Pershing Square North is uh, 1135. If I want to see the most common end station ID, then again, I can just do a text facet on this. And if I sort by count, right, so I know that of the five of, of the 1135 um, trips that started there, there's 200, it ended at 263 different stations. Uh, 35 of them were at station ID 498, which is Broadway and West 32nd Street. I've got 30, we go to 33rd and 7th, et cetera, et cetera, right? So all of a sudden I can start to get a sense of kind of where are people going from certain stations? Um, again, I might want to look at this in terms of time. We'll talk about how to do that. Um, but basically this just gives us a really nice way to kind of, uh, focus our data set and get some ideas about what's going on in there. Um, now there are some limitations. There are some challenges to this data set as I commented when we were looking at, um, the JSON file, which is that we don't have things like borough, right? It's a little hard to get a sense from this of the geographic organization of um of city bike uh of city bike stations and that's of course um you know we do have the latitude and longitude but latitude and longitude doesn't translate super neatly into something like borough or area of the city um so what we're going to do next is um we're going to scan through actually looking at the start station name and we're going to look at some of the tools that uh that open refine has for cleaning up data um, also for reproducing our work with the data and for trying to find common features um, within, um, within a given cell. Um, so I'll be back in just a few minutes with that.